Now this is my lizard. This is a bearded dragon, and I love this little girl. She's not an iguana, but we're gonna draw one with pen and ink in this lesson. Hello there everyone, Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com and in this video we're going to create a pen and ink drawing of an iguana on Heritage Hot Press watercolor paper. Now why are we creating this drawing on, on watercolor paper? Well it's because we're going to eventually add watercolor applications over the top. But in this video we're just going to do the pen and ink drawing and I shouldn't say just do the pen and ink drawing because it's going to be a fully developed pen and ink drawing and in the next video that I release we'll apply the watercolor applications. But before we do, I'd like to remind you that if you're new to the channel or if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that notification bell so you're notified when we post new videos. And if you wanna go a lot deeper with your drawing and painting skills, then check out our comprehensive membership program, which includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subject matter and media, including a complete course on line and wash, which is drawing with pen and ink and applying watercolor washes. We also have weekly live lessons, which are part of the membership program, weekly critiques, which are part of the members minute, and a year long curriculum for visual arts teachers. If you wanna check out our membership program, I'll leave a link in the description below. Everyone starts off with a week-long trial for free. If you want to just get your feet wet and check out a few of our course videos and eBooks for free, you can do so as well. Again, I'll leave a link in the description below. Now for this series, we're going to be working on Canson Heritage Hot Press watercolor paper. This of course is a smoother surfaced watercolor paper. It's different from cold press watercolor paper. This makes this paper suitable for pen and ink applications. So we're going to be applying the pen and ink, of course, and then applying watercolor washes over the top of that. I'm going to be starting with a 4H graphite pencil. Then from there, we'll move on to the pen and ink applications. And I'll be using two different pens by two different manufacturers. I'll be using a Stiedler Point One pen, which is a fairly thin pen. And I'll also be using a 003 Micron pen, which is a super thin pen, mainly for applying the value and doing the shading and so on. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into this process. We'll begin here on the hot press watercolor paper using a 4H graphite pencil. Now I'm using this lighter pencil so that the graphite lines that I apply are easily erased and not noticeable in the final pen and ink drawing. I'm using a fairly light touch here to loosely sketch out the outer contours and the basic shapes of the iguana. You can see here I'm using sketchier lines. I like to approach a drawing this way. I'll start with some sketchier lines and as I become a little bit more confident with the lines that I have in place, then I'll gradually apply more pressure to the pencil. When using a harder pencil like this 4H pencil, it's important not to press too hard, however, because you can put grooves or indentations in the surface of the paper, which may be visible in the final image. I'm working from the top of the picture plane down to the lower part of the picture plane for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm right-handed and just generally work from the top to the bottom. A second reason I'm working this way is because the area of most importance is the head of the iguana. So I'm starting in this area, of course, and working my way outward from there. Although I'm trying to replicate what I see in the photo reference as much as possible, I am allowing myself a little bit of freedom. You can see here that in my drawing, I'm zoomed in a little bit closer than what we see in the photo reference. Of course, this is perfectly acceptable as long as I keep the proportions approximately similar. You can see here where we have some of the folds of the skin of the iguana, which seem pretty complex. I'm just basically drawing lines here where I'm seeing contrast and value. So value is the darkness or lightness of color. And when we see these folds overlap on top of other sections, a, a shadow is produced. And of course that creates some contrast and I'm simplifying that contrast into some easily understood lines. You can also see that I'm adding some of these horns or whatever these spiky things are on the back of the iguana. Again, they don't have to be perfectly accurate to what we see in the reference. We just want to make sure that we have the repetition in our drawing that's similar to what we see in the reference. Obviously, there are some complex patterns here and some intricate textures. And with the graphite pencil, we're not going to worry about these too much. We might give some indications of where we see some of these larger horns and things. But again, we're not going to get too carried away with the texture. Not at this point anyway. 
Now I'm going to add a little bit more character to the mouth of this iguana in my drawing. It's something a little bit different than what we see in the reference. I want the iguana to appear a little bit more smug in the drawing. All right, once we've got our graphite drawing in place, we're ready to start with the pen and ink applications. And I'm going to start with the larger of the two pens that I'm using. Now, this is still a very small tip here. This is a 0.1 pen by Steeler. And I'm using a Steeler pen and also a Micron pen. Now, uh, this pen, of course, is going to make a slightly larger mark than what we see with the Micron pen that will follow. So I'm basically more concerned with the contour lines or the outlines, mainly in the areas where I'm I see uh, some dark shadow or some of the larger shapes that we see on the iguana. As I'm adding the pen and ink applications, I am going to consider and think about the line quality. Now, I like to refer to line quality as the thickness or thinness of a line. Some people call uh, varying your line width just simply that, but I like to refer to it as line quality, even though there's lots of qualities that are associated with line. So I'm going to be considering my line quality, and I'm starting with some of the larger lines here initially. Throughout the process, you'll see that I add smaller lines, and I also go back and beef up some of the lines here here and there. Again, ensuring that variety. Variety is one of the eight principles of art, and it's important to include in our work. Now, of course, as we're developing the pen and ink applications here, we are doing two things here. We're establishing the contour line drawing or the contours of the subject, the outlines of the subject, of course. But we're also going to be developing the shadowing or the shading here. And this means that we're going to be manipulating the value. Now, when we're developing the value with pen and ink, of course, we can use hatching, cross hatching, stippling. There's lots of different methods that we can use with the pen and ink to develop the shadow here. I'm going to be mainly using hatching here to develop the drawing and of course we're going to be adding watercolor applications later in the process in another video but uh, as we develop the value we need to of course consider the fact that the white of the paper is going to be playing a role here and the positioning of the lines that we add is also going to be playing a role so the more white of the paper we show through or we allow to show through the lighter the value that's developed but we're also developing the contour lines here and you can see I'm still in that stage in the drawing where I'm developing the outlines of the drawing and I'm focusing mainly on where I see dark lines so in these scales uh, that are repeated throughout the uh, the body of the iguana I'm mainly putting these lines on the lower portion of these scales and later somewhat of a broken line on the top edge of each one of these scales to indicate a little bit of highlight. So we don't have to outline everything. That's essentially what I'm saying here. As you can see here, I've already moved on to the smaller micron pen. This is a, a 003 pen. It's super tiny tip here. This is a relatively small drawing anyway. And I'm going to be using this pen mostly for developing the shadow or the shading in this drawing. You can see I'm starting in the eye and I used lines coming out from the center of the line to create some of that darker value. And now I'm going in and putting some indication of the texture and also some hatching marks here to begin the process of developing the shadow. Now I'm going to use the smaller pen to establish some of the texture and some of the upper lines on some of the scales here. Uh, again, this is going to create that variety and line quality that we need, of course. One of the things we need to watch out for when working with the pen and ink drawing is that we don't go too dark too quickly developing our shading here. It's very easy to do so. So it's always a good idea to kind of go a little bit lighter than you think you might need because you can always add additional applications of ink to make the value a little bit darker. Now I am again starting at the top of the picture plane and I'm working my way down to the bottom and to the right. Again, this is mostly because I'm right handed, but also because this upper portion of the picture plane is going to have the most detail. It is the area of most importance, obviously, with the head of the iguana. Now I'm using lines that flow along the form of each one of these scales here. So you can see the hatching marks that I make are going to change direction slightly. And I'm just trying to follow the plane that's created in three dimensional space there uh, as I'm making these marks. This will not only help to develop the shading, obviously, but also help to communicate the form of the lizard as well. So you'll notice this a, a little bit more clearly as we work underneath the chin of the iguana here uh, as we continue to develop the value in the shading here. 
Now, I also want to point out that my lines are not perfect, of course. Uh, I'm not really overthinking the lines as I'm adding them. I am thinking about what I'm doing, obviously, but I'm not overthinking things. So I'm not too tentative with the marks. I'm not putting too much pressure on the pen as well. And my lines are a little bit sketchier than you might expect here. Uh, the drawing is still going to look pretty sharp and controlled in the end, but you can allow yourself a little bit of freedom with your mark making and uh, not get too overly obsessed with making the perfect perfect mark. It's really easy to kind of get trapped into that kind of thinking when you're working with a permanent medium like ink here. Uh, of course, it's obviously difficult to change or erase anything that you put on the surface. So that can lead to uh, some folks being a little bit tentative with their marks, but don't feel that way at all. Um, you know, pen and ink is not a very forgiving medium, but you also have a little bit of freedom there to be a little bit looser with your marks, a little bit more so than you might expect. Now, obviously, texture is very important in this drawing, and uh, there are a variety of different textures in this uh, particular subject. And uh, you can see here, the way I'm handling this is basically just repeating a pattern that I see. And uh, this pattern, of course, is mainly made up of the scales on the body of the lizard, obviously. Now, what's important to note here is that this pattern, of course, is made up of irregular shapes and also um, irregular sizes as well. So in some areas the shapes are a little bit larger and some are a little bit smaller and I'm just basically using my photo reference as a guide as to where I need to make those shapes a little bit larger or a little bit smaller and it's as simple as that I'm not trying to get too overly obsessed with making everything exactly the way that I see it in the reference instead I'm basically just focusing on the patterns that I see and I'm trying to replicate that pattern as best as I can even though it's not exactly the same as it is in the reference now you'll also notice that I've gone back and I've made some of the lines a little bit thicker in areas. Of course, that's to encourage that variety in line quality that we need. You can see this with uh, the little spiky things that come down the beard of uh, the uh, iguana and also in, in between some of the scales where I've gone back and made some of the lines a little bit thicker. And as a result, some of the lines appear a little bit thinner, of course, and that's creating that variety. Now, of course, as we're getting some of the ink on the surface, we're better understanding the relationships of values that we have on, on the paper. And you can see I'm going back and I'm making some of the areas a little bit darker because we need to make those values a little bit darker. And I'm just using additional hatching marks to do so. Again, I'm trying to avoid using cross hatching. I feel like when you're adding watercolor to an image, sometimes the cross hatching can get a little busy looking. So I'm trying to keep everything uh, pretty consistent here with the hatching. So as we continue to work to the right side of the picture plane, you can see that I've added a little bit of shadow underneath some of those spiky horned things coming off the, the spine of the iguana. And I'm also continuing with the pattern here. Now, this is obviously a patient process. You have to kind of force yourself to work a little bit slower here. If you're impatient, that's something that you probably need to work on when you're working with a pen and ink drawing. Uh, just take breaks throughout the process. I typically like to work for about 20 to 40 minutes in one little session then I'll take a five or ten minute break and then go back to it that kind of keeps my mind fresh and keeps me focused on uh, the drawing process obviously because even though it might not feel like it you are constantly making decisions throughout the process and that can wear you out it can it can make you uh, feel a little bit of uh, a brain drain if you will so taking those breaks every once in a while is, is important at least it's important for me. So don't feel like you have to sit down and complete a drawing in one sitting. In fact, uh, with the pen and ink applications and the watercolor applications, in total this drawing took approximately six hours to complete. And it's not a very large drawing either. I think it's four and a half inches by six and a half inches. Perhaps it's somewhere around that size. So it's a pretty small drawing and it still took a substantial amount of time here for a smaller drawing. As you can see, as we work down the body of the iguana, the pattern changes here. We've got a lot more dark values here. Um, now, I just want to point out here that when you're creating a pen and ink drawing, you're interpreting what you see in reality, whether from a photo reference or direct observation, into lines, basically, or the way that you're going to apply the ink to create the illusion. And we're all going to interpret what we see a little bit differently. And as a result, the marks and patterns that we make on the drawing surface are going to be different from one an artist to the next and that's perfectly acceptable we all are going to come up with different solutions some are going to be better than others uh, but 
I don't want you to think that you have to interpret things exactly the way another artist might interpret them in order to be successful because we all uh, have our own artistic visions and we can all apply them to our own artworks, of course. Now you can see on the right side of the picture plane here, we've got lighter values here. So I'm leaving a little bit more of the white of the paper showing through as I'm creating these patterns and textures here. And then it's back to some of the darker patterns here in the lower part of the picture plane. You can see the method that I came up here, came up with here for this particular section is just basically to draw a repetition of these crescent shapes and then filling in the spaces in between with hatching. And then, of course, I'm going back and reestablishing some of the contour lines that I've lost with some thicker lines again with the Steeler pen. Now, throughout this process, I do keep going back to this particular area and I keep making these darker shapes a little bit darker. Um, in the video that will follow this with the watercolor applications, you'll see that I make some of those values a little bit darker with the watercolor and then also with the pen and ink at the very end of the process. But for now, we'll move on down to the leg and the body of of the iguana, which is pretty much what we've got left here. And again, you can see that these hatching marks that I've used here curve slightly to uh, replicate, of course, or communicate, I should say, the form of the leg here, of course, because it, it curves a little bit as well. Here you can see the methodology I used to create a lot of the patterning on the body of the iguana. I basically just drew guidelines and then filled in those guidelines with the repeating shapes here. And I did this here and there. I didn't do it for every section, but uh, for the particularly laborious, repetitive sections, I definitely did that to make sure that I kind of kept this pattern in, in its place and it followed along or flowed along the co cross contours of the form of each section. Now you can see I'm continuing to work my way down, of course, and this is another section where we had a lot of dark value. Again, I chose to use hatching here instead of solid marks so that my drawing felt consistent. Um, I didn't want to have any areas where I just had flat black. Instead, I wanted to uh, allow a little bit of that texture to be consistent. And when I'm referring to texture here, I'm talking about the texture of the actual pin marks, uh, of course, the hatching. And here, even in this lower section of the body, there is a slightly darker value. So I used hatching here again, flowing over the form of this particular section. And then, of course, we had one little last section to address here. And of course, again, since I'm right handed, this ended up being the lower right hand portion of the picture plane. And again, uh, you can see those guidelines that I used again, going in and filling in some of those larger shapes uh, that make up the pattern and then adding a little bit of value there with the hatching. Now, I chose to make the hatching marks go in a slightly different direction in this section so that there was a little bit of contrast from one section to the next. And then, of course, after waiting for the ink to dry, I could use a kneaded eraser to erase away any remaining graphite lines, leaving just a pen and ink drawing just begging for some watercolor applications, which we'll apply in the next video. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you were able to pick up a couple of things here and there. Now that we've got our pen and ink drawing in place, we're ready to apply the watercolor and we'll do so in the next video of this series. So make sure that you are subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss that video, of course. And again, I'll remind you if you want to check out three of our course videos and ebooks for free, there's a link in the description below. Thanks again so much for watching. And as always, I wish you all the very best in your artistic success.